everybody. Welcome to Being No Table Games and More. This week, I'm my. It's my pleasure to have uh, Willie Allison as my guest. Willie is the founder of the World Game Protection uh, Conference. Uh, hopefully, it's going to go off this uh, October. Uh, great event in its fifteenth year, uh, by the way. So Willie's a kind of a busy man. He, he you know, just putting on a conference like this uh, takes off a mountain of time to get through and get and prepare. But he's also got a, a great podcast called The uh, Dropbox that he co-hosts with uh, Andy Yule, uh, a, a, a guy we had on a few weeks ago. Great kid, very smart, up and comer in the industry. Uh, you'll hear that name for quite some time. Uh, he's the author of Blackjack Insiders. Also, uh, uh, Willie produces a, uh, a monthly, I think, is it monthly, Willie, a uh, newsletter? Yeah, I try to get it out every month, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, Willie, welcome, and thank you for uh, joining us here on BNNO. Thank you, Benny. I appreciate it so much, man. And it's finally actually nice to meet you, even though it's not in person. We've communicated a lot. We go back and forth over the years on on casino guy kind of stuff, but it's good to see you in person, man. It's good to see you fine. Yeah, I was at the uh, I was at the conference year before last, I think, and and you're just so surrounded with people. You get, it's like it's the uh, you know it's like Frank Sinatra's at something or something. You can't you can't get near you. So we we said uh, passing high, and that's all I got to. But if I get out there this year, we're gonna, we're going to do more than that. So let me, uh, Willie, uh, you're a Vegas. Are you a Vegas resident? I take it. Yeah, yeah, I've lived here for about eighteen years now. Yeah. So what, give me, what's, what's been going on? I know you and Andy walked the strip. Uh, you know, what have you seen out there? What, what, what's going on? All right, let me take you back to the start. So the state of Nevada, we basically shut down. That includes the casinos, of course, back on uh, oh, April the, sorry, March the 17th. We shut down the next day. So we were closed for 78 days. Um, we reopened, or we got permission to reopen the casinos on June the 4th. And on that day, I was talking to Andy. I said, hey, why don't we, just to get some ideas for a podcast, why don't we go for a walk? Why don't we go check it out on opening day? So we went for a walk. It was a and, hike, wasn't it? It was a hike. It wasn't a walk. It was like seven miles, he said he went. It, is, it might be a hike for you, buddy. It's just a walk in the park for me. <laughs> no, no, actually it was because... I hadn't done any exercise for a while, so it was a hike. It was actually like, I think, 4.2 miles. We clocked it, and we had our app. It was about 17,000 or so far. But here's the thing. I, out of the 28 casinos on the Strip, and we didn't go downtown, we didn't go out to the Burbs, uh, only 15 were open anyway. So that made the day a lot quicker. We were able to get around. And to be honest, it was really easy to get around because there wasn't that many people on the first day. And it was... We went from like midday through to five. So we saw some interesting things. He posted an article, I wrote an article about it, uh, which apparently went out into the casino sphere. And, um, you know, hopefully it was helpful because a lot of people at that time, there hadn't been a lot of communication in the industry. Um, I'd hazard to say this probably still isn't, right? So, you know, none of us have been through a pandemic before, right? I mean, none of us have shut down property for this long. So what, what do we do? Uh, so I, I think it was helpful as we were able to sit down and compare what everybody was doing. And what we found is, well, kind of everybody was doing something different. <laughs> and it was really interesting to me. What happened here in Nevada, I'm not sure about where you're from, was that the, the state government asked each property to submit a plan. Now, I don't know whether that meant they were going to approve it or not. It doesn't look like they have. So it's sort of like, opened it up for the casino guys. Suddenly now they were forced to become medical experts right. and were playing together. And it really shows, even to this day, everybody's doing something different. Um, we were surprised at what we found. We thought it would have been tighter. I, having a surveillance security type background, as well as a gaming, I look at things from a risk perspective. Um, I look at the coronavirus as a very, very serious thing that we need to get under control. And I think that I, I was a little disappointed, to be honest. I felt that it was almost like casinos were pitching this. Let's come back to the way it was before, when they really, I would have liked to have seen 
um, wearing of masks, more sanitizer, all the things that we know needs to be done. There was a very laissez-faire attitude. So Willie, on one of my uh, previous podcasts, I showed a video from the uh, uh, Cosmo the first Saturday night. And it looked to me as uh, that, you know, everybody was looking the other way. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, the bar was slammed. Uh, the dis social distance was not even a, a, a part of the thought pattern for anybody that I could see. And I was just worried, you know, even if you go back to the, uh, the first book of when, the 32-page document, by the time they started with uh, version 2.1, by the time it got done, it was like a 3.7, and it was so watered down from the original uh, uh, document, and, and it just seemed like it was all uh, maybe lip service. You know, we really weren't getting a, 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 a serious effort, you know, uh, on protecting people from this virus. And it, it was concerning. And it seems like, you know, now two weeks went by, I, I guess they tagged a couple of positives uh, there on the strip. And now all of a sudden, you know, no mask, no service. <laughs> yeah, well, look, going back, I mean, I think we all know, uh, especially with Vegas, you open the door and say we're open for business. How do you control that? Ooh. We've built ourselves this reputation of what happens here stays here. We're free and easy. Do whatever you want. And that's still there to this day. Um, the other challenge that Vegas has is, you know, we don't have uh, crowd control abilities at the entrance. Uh, anybody can come and go as they please. So that was always going to be an issue, right? The social distancing, there was going to be a pent up demand. People have been locked up for two and a half months, right? So you say, come on down, I'll open the doors. Everybody's going to go in there. Now, talk, go, let's go back to the wind document. Uh, what I find is interesting is there's about a thousand casinos, or what I class as casinos, across the US. And it seemed to me that uh, Wynn were the first to put their documents out. And I suspect it's uh, Wynn, Venetian, and MGM have properties in Macau. And they went through this three months previously. They actually shut their properties in March. So they had something to go on. So they sort of cut and paste something. And Wynn comes out with this big document. And it seemed to flow around the casino industry for which everybody took that into their director's meeting and they went, as we do in this industry, and you know we do, right? We, 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 we follow, we're like sheep. Oh, what's Wynn and Vegas doing? What's, what's Vegas doing? Let's see what they're doing, right? So they cut and paste a lot of those depending on which market they was. I will say that when you look at the measures that have been put in place across the country, and at today, July the 28th, there's about 75 to 80% of the properties are reopened. You know, half of the properties are Indian casinos and the other half are non-Indian casinos. Seems to me the Indian casinos do seem to take it a lot more seriously. Like they almost went off the win menu of measures to do it and said, I'll have all of that. They're, yeah. they're doing, in fact, what's interesting, and you know this, in the last week, because we're getting this re-spike happening, it's going through the roof, actually. More infections today than there was in the middle of the shutdown period. But the Indian casinos, I know of about five at least, that where they had an employee get tested positive, unfortunately one of those casinos, an employee passed away, right? As has just happened in the last few days here in Las Vegas. The Indian casino shut down, mm -hmm. absolutely shut down. They sanitized. Now every, for the last week or two in Vegas, there's been numerous reports of employees uh, testing positive. Is there any shutdown? No. What is there? There's this line that's coming out now called contact tracing. This yeah. is what we are people like to use. So we've tested an employee and now we're initiating our, uh, our surveillance and our contact tracing. Yeah, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, well, you know, the thing about coronavirus is that, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the, the, the HRI that I work for, the Hard Rock International. We, you know, we, our stance has always been mask for the guests, mask for the employees, uh, you know, thermal imaging, uh, sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. And still, let me tell you what, you're not going to keep the virus out of these places. Because when people go home, you can't tell them to keep, wear their mask or tell them to not party. And it's, uh, it's just, it's going to happen. Uh, we've got to really be conscious of the hospitalizations and see where we stand with that. 
the virus spiking is a virus spiking. I mean, if we're going to open up the country, that's that's definitely going to happen. There's just no there's no stopping that. But if the hospitalizations get out of control, uh, we're we we need to take action. But anyway, uh, enough on that. Let me ask you something. How'd you get started? How does how does all Willie is a, a young man, and uh, you know uh, I think you were down under. Uh, so uh, how, where where did the casino come into all that? <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of us, we, I just fell into it. I was 21 years old. I just got married. I needed a job. I'm from a little town called the Gold Coast in Australia. It's a nice little strip of beaches, and there's not much in way of pl- employment opportunities. And the Hilton came along in the mid-'80s, and they, they built a casino there, okay? So I thought, okay, well, I need a job. I just got married, so I went and applied for a job. And back in them days, you used to sit through a classroom sitting math test and all that when they were recruiting for dealers. So I did all that. I did okay. And I got a call back uh, about a week later. I said, hey, look, we got this job in surveillance. Would you be interested? I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> you know, what is surveillance? And they explain it's the little bubbles in the, in the ceiling. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. Don't worry. We train everyone for three months and so I took the job and fell in love with the job and and that's where it started from there uh, just like you bumped around a lot in this industry if you want to move up you sometimes got to move sideways and stuff like that I've managed to have the opportunity to work in Asia uh, South America of course here in Vegas uh, and some other places so I did that for 15 years I was a surveillance director for about 10 of those years uh, I also worked on the floor for a, a little bit when Treasure Island here in Vegas opened back in the early 90s. I transferred across from uh, Mirage Surveillance there. I enjoyed that because it gave me another perspective. Um, you may know, know that some surveillance guys, they get little tunnel visions sometimes. It was good to see both sides, but I prefer the game protection side and surveillance. So, um, so about 15 years worth of actual operations before you, your passion for protection led you in a different direction. And you decided it was time to put something out there for the general public in the protection realm. And that's, I guess that's when World Game Protection Conference was born around 2006, was that, Willie? Yeah, what happened was I was working in Argentina in the early 2000s and the country went bankrupt. Okay, it went broke. Right. So, you know, I was in revenues dropped from 100 to 70 percent. So my wife and I, my wife from Kentucky, Joe, uh, we moved back to Vegas. All roads led back. So for a couple of years, I was working for vendors. At that time, at the turn of the century, we were going from analog to digital. Thought that would have been a great opportunity to uh, to learn about technology because I like that stuff. And it was, and it also gave me the opportunity to tour around the States and visit other casinos. So I had operational experience. I was selling technology. Um, a couple of years into that, I thought to myself, how come there's not a, a conference or a trade show where we can sit around as an industry and talk about the specific uh, area of game protection, game security, and the technology? No one was doing it. Um, G2E had a big two show, but they didn't really emphasize that small part of it. So I said, well, look, it's my passion. Why don't I give this a go? So I quit my job and, um, you know, I, I had a little money in the bank. I put it together and we, we got it together. 2005, we started the business. Two, February 2006 was our first show. And we've been having an annual show every year in February, March since then. This was going to be our 15th year this year. You know what I noticed that when I went to your conference versus like G2E or, or some of the other events, uh, the, the, you know, the people there are sitting there taking notes. They're actually paying attention to what, what's going on. You know, it's just not something somebody sent them on a mission with a, a expense account and they're dropping in, they're having a beer and walking out. They're actually trying to consume some of the information. So I was, I was really impressed with that aspect of this show. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, by the way, they do like to have a beer and, and drop out too. But, you know, we're a conference first. And my wife and I pride ourselves. And I think that's what sets us apart from most other ones. The big shows are trying to be everything to everybody. 
this is my passion. This is our niche. So at the two, three days that we feel is all about that. And we're very proud. Like this year, uh, I think we're going to have about 23, 24 speakers. We bring together a lot of speakers. Um, over half of them this year were insiders. Um, I, I, I find that other conferences across the country tend to just ask vendors to speak. In fact, vendors will pay to speak to get in front of them and so forth, consultants and so forth. But it's great to hear insiders, operational people that are on the front lines every day, uh, getting together and sharing information. So I, I think the notes comes from, you know, I spend a lot of time each year putting a program together. Um, and sometimes it's difficult if you want to get a good balance. I try to uh, get a balance from international casinos, local casinos, and all that. So, yeah, it's valuable information. I also like to think that it's stuff that you can't get online, right? <laughs> well, let me, uh, let, we'll, we'll go back to this year's World Game uh, Protection Conference. I want to ask you a couple questions before we get there. Um, when you get outside of Las Vegas, you may not know this, <clears throat> surveillance gets to be a little tough to staff. Uh, it's got a little bit to do with the salaries. It's got a little bit to do with people don't realize once they get outside of Vegas that you have to work Friday and Saturday. Uh, that's like, oh my God, I got to work Friday, Saturday. Uh, some of them can't take the confinement of the room. And, it, and, you know, the understaffing, you know, puts burden of responsibility, a huge burden of responsibility on these young people trying to, you know, watch all these monitors and these, some of these casinos, you know, once you get uh, out of Vegas, are, are gigantic. They're gigantic ca uh, casinos, and there's just so much. And so there's a lot of roadblocks to a good room outside of Vegas. Thinking about that, Willie, do you have any kind of idea that what, what you could share with some of these directors on how they could overcome them roadblocks? 60% uh, of it is because they're underpaid, right? Uh, they don't have the ability to make tips or anything like that. So they're stuck in between. They're not getting a middle manager salary or anything like that. Probably not even a floor supervisor. So. But they're not making minimum wage where they rely on tips. So they don't make that much money, right? Now, what I find is people like the job. But it is a, a job of isolation and confinement, right? There, there, is, there are large periods of time where it can be quite boring. Um, and then there's exciting times when you're, when you're hopping, right? So I think they're a very small department. I think a, a lot of people in surveillance often sometimes feel that uh, the road stops there. There's no career path for them um, because a lot of casinos have introduced policies where they can't transfer out. Um, some you can't transfer in. So if you're set in a small department, where you you often find the manager or the director, or maybe his shift managers, have been there for 20 years, right? They're, they're happy because they're making a reason why, but at the frontline level, they can't go anywhere. They're a little trapped because they don't have the recognition across the organization because of the collusion, or sorry, the policies of not being able to uh, associate with anyone else in the organization. Sometimes it's a bit lonely there. Yeah, I, I think the lack of recognition, you hit it on the head there, is it's got to be hard to stomach because they do so much, so much that they, they don't ask for thanks for, or, and they don't get a pat on the back, but just let them miss something and you've got a GM down your throat, you know, uh, going crazy because you, you missed one thing that probably would have been missed anyway. You know, we, you can't be at all places at all time. So, uh let me ask you this. Let's go into surveillance here now. What you've heard out there in the real world right now, what's more damaging to the bottom line, an advantage player or internal theft? What, what in your opinion, is? Well, internal theft. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the, in the coming years, it's going to be a bigger issue because uh, through this quarantining, I mean, look at Vegas. We've got... Out of the 28 casinos, there's 21 or 20 open. So there's a lot of people out there that are still unemployed, having problem getting the money, and they're struggling, right? Uh, they did a survey not so long ago, not particularly happy with the way a lot of the uh, casino corporations handle this in terms of communication. So they're way behind. You know, they've got to find a way to get back to where they were before. 
So that they, you know, I, I think that internal theft, it actually, for the last 10, 15 years, it's way surpassed advantage play. And we can have a discussion about, well, how do you know, right? How do you know? Because maybe you're just not catching the advantage play and, and stuff like that. We know because the biggest scams in our history, well, at least from the time we got video cameras, which was back in 75, we know that the biggest scams, the multi-million dollar scams, have happened in the last 10 years. Are we talking about the collusion scams? Not so much internal theft. Dealers are cheap, uh, stealing chips all the time. But when they get with players, so now you've also got a, you've got a, a situation in the next couple of years where we're going to go into a recession, right? Uh, let me take you back to the last recession, right, 2008. There was an increase in large scams around 2010, 2011. Multi-million dollar scams where teams were traveling the world recruiting dealers. We're going back to that period now, so that's a really easy question. I personally think we spend too much time on advantage play. I, I think that it's low-lying fruit. It's very easy to pick. Um, it's funny, you know, people, <laughs> uh, some of the security surveillance guys have been worried about the wearing of the masks in the casinos. I'm like, ah. As it turns out, from what I've seen circulated, they're still picking them up. So all the guys out there that thought they could still come in and take advantage, we, we already, we know who you are, but it hasn't been a problem. Um, if you're looking or you've been trained to be able to detect and identify the moves, and if you've been, if you have a management group that's enforcing the procedures, it's all fine. We have mechanisms in place to pick up car counting and stuff like that. But internal theft is going to be an issue. And I think it's going to be a bigger issue because I think there's going to be some cutbacks in staffing, and I think it's going to start with supervisors. It always does. We need someone to deal with the game, and I can see uh, supervisor levels going from four to one to eight to one, so there'll be no one over these guys' shoulders. Of course, we don't need a boxman either, right? It's a, <laughs> started it all, right? That was the start. But, you know, the internal theft in my lifetime, one thing about get, getting old is you get to see a lot of this, and that it, it gets all the way down into time theft, right? I mean, dealers, uh, you know, not clocking in and then you know somebody just gives them their full eight hours or whatever it gets all the way back here and internal theft is just it's just a big topic i think you could probably do two seminars on just internal theft it, to every degree even the smallest degree is multi-millions of dollars so let me ask you this what do you seen over the last 15 years of the conference what's the what's the biggest change in protection in the last 15 years? Well, there hasn't been any change in protection. No. No, there's no change. No change. Digital cameras or digital cameras, but I guess that's a big change going from digital to analog. There's been improvements in technology, no yeah. doubt. Where HD is there, that's great. That allows us to get a better mugshot of somebody who does something naughty. But does it help us detect anything? Not really. Uh, we were. And it'd be, this year, actually, we were going to talk a lot about artificial intelligence, which I believe is the future. That's the next, next step. But yeah, we got good cameras now, but I'd argue that that's helping us pick up more crime or making our game protection better. Um, we still are using chips. So we still can't see how many chips are on a bet, right? What we can be doing with camera technology is experimenting with locations and different positioning of the chips. But I, I think moving forward, the, the future is uh, AI for various reasons. But, but the last 15 years, no. I, I, look, here's the interesting thing. About 10 years ago, first years of our show, uh, I felt really optimistic that the world was starting to talk to each other, share information. Uh, you know, obviously our conference is a great place for all of that. But in the last five to eight years, I, I, I feel that casino lawyers, especially, uh, they put a gag yeah. on the security surveillance guys, and to a certain extent, the table guys, managers, you can't talk about things that go on. In fact, I'm really worried going back to COVID that the casino cone of silence is gonna come down. 
if I could just speak briefly, when you look at the world right now, and that includes the casino industry and the country and the world, what I was really shocked about is there's no global effort to get on this. No one, let's stick to the casino industry. The American Gaming Association, I don't know what they do. I know they're a lobbyist group and they do other stuff. But I just would have thought this is like the number one thing on everyone's list, right? It leads into the economy and all that sort of stuff. But was there a forum where people went, okay, look, we've got with uh, Dr. Fauci and all these people and we've done all this. No, everybody seems to be doing their own thing. So getting back to gain protection, I sort of feel like the last five years, um, they've sort of, you know, things happen and I find out about them, but they're not reported. You know, not, not a lot of sharing of information like uh, there should be. Well, and that's why people are probably surprised to hear when I say employee theft is more of an issue because we don't report employee theft. People go, really? I, I never heard about that, right? Oh, no, there is. We hear about card counters and the five cheaters. They don't lose their gaming license. They're right back in. When I was in Nevada, they just come right back in. Uh, you see them in the arts. Oh, this guy ripped off. He's working over here, you know? Yeah, well, how often, um, and you know, I have a Twitter account and every day I feed that with, with searches of incidents and what happened. And everyone's like, yahoo, we got a $10 pass poster. It's a fresh kill, right? You call the police down, you show them the video, whether they've ever seen a table before in their life, they get it. Somebody put a weight bet after the result. So they prosecute. It makes the newspapers. But now when you get to the tricky high tech, Kind of, kind of the cool scams, you will not hear anything until it goes through the courts. It might take two or three years. And, you know, one is, there's a case going on right now, Benny, you've probably heard about the card room in California. Now, this is the Mike Possle case, who's been allegedly, they, they live stream uh, poker. Allegedly, there's been cheating through a third party actually looking at the results of the cards through the RFID cards. And, you know, that's going to be a long, drawn-out thing. But that's, that's, and we're not going to get any information from that casino. In fact, there's not been one iota come out of them. But we need to know what went down there. We can't wait till five years down the track after appeals and courts and that. We need to be able to share that. So it just goes to, I really think there's going to be a huge increase. And, and scams spread like wildfire when somebody, you know, it's like this, uh, my, my thoughts right now is on, uh, you know, psychological advantage play where these people force uh, people to make bad payoffs or uh, they claim they had a bet that they didn't have and they're getting paid. They're getting paid and they got no chance of getting uh, prosecuted. So let's move on. Uh, what, what's the most relevant area of protection when it comes to table games in your opinion? Uh, most relevant? Yeah, what, what would you look for if, you know, if you were, you were setting up a room and you said, hey, to your, to your, your table games guys, would you look for roulette scams, blackjack scams, counters? What would, what would be the most area you'd focus on? Baccarat, uh, by far. I mean, when you look, I'm a risk-based guy. And where's the risk? The risk is with the big money. I'm going to let some little ones go through on the blackjack table on that every now and then. That's fine because people will, will take their shot on that. But in Baccarat, it is so conducive to team collusion scams, it's not funny, right? The other reason is casino managers tend to pander a little bit more to the big players. So if you've got a con artist with a group of people, they're gonna scam the table, they can sort of get the casino to bend the rules a little bit. I come in and I, plonk down 200,000 at the cage, and I say, I want to play back or up, you know, it, it, you're going to go, well, yeah, okay, whatever you want, sir. Well, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. And going back to, you know, what we were talking about before, here's one thing, here's, here's the, what I've noticed in the last 15 years with scams. No, I'm going to go back even further. I'm going to go back my whole career, 33 years. I have near, never seen a scam that couldn't have been prevented if the procedures were enforced, if they just stuck with what the rules and didn't change them, pandering to the person with a lot of money would be good. So the short answer is Baccarat. I would have my, uh, most of my attention on that. 
Um, now, most casinos don't have that rule. Well, no, I'm sorry. A lot of the casinos don't. You guys have it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is no one sort of common scam right now. Um, there's this, you know, there's what I call the little stuff, which is, you know, uh, changing the bet after the result. You pass post in your bet, can't think your two bet stuff. That's always going to happen all the time. And some of the times the defense is, well, I would just had a few much to drink, right? And they get away with it, they walk out the door. Uh, but no, it's, it's definitely Baccarat. It always has been Baccarat because you can lose a lot of money if an employee is putting in a false shuffle or colluding or the favorite in the last 10 years has been the camera scams, identifying the cards and the sequences and the slugs. So I would put most of my attention there. Well, I always tell, uh, you know, uh, GM will be talking about Baccarat and they said, well, yeah, we got a $10,000 limit. I said, no, you don't have a $10,000 limit. You got a $70,000 limit on that game. I said, because every spot can bet $10,000. So, uh, you know, they, they don't look at it that way and the exposure they could possibly have. One of the best scams I've seen uh, going now is, is the players will uh, sit there and they'll, they'll see a dealer in, in these jurisdictions outside of Las Vegas. They make a lot of mistakes. And they'll see them pull a third card uh, that's wrong, and they'll just not say anything about it. And the next hand, everybody's got max bet out there. And if they win, that's all well and good. But if they lose, they'll say, oh, on the last hand, he pulled, he pulled the wrong card. And, of course, they go back and review it. He did. Now we either let them push or, or, or we, you know, something, 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 we're, we're going to lose money in the deal no matter how we do it. So we're running out of time. I want to get to talk about World Game Protection 2020. Uh, it's going to be at the Tropicana, hope so. And uh, what, 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 what do we look forward to this year? Well, you know, let's start at the beginning. We right now are in a holding pattern, whether it's going to go ahead or not. My wife and I are pushing for it, but here's a couple of issues we've got to deal with right now. Right now, regardless of what any show says out there, in the state of Nevada, you can't have a meeting of 50 people or more. So until that happens, we can't go ahead. Now, you mentioned the truck. Well, who would have knew that this would be a problem? Truck, I don't even know if the truck is going to be open. Uh, they've, uh, they're a Penn National Group. They're the only uh, casino owner on the strip not to open the casino. They open the M Resort, which is out there. It doesn't bother me. I'm supposed to be having a show there. Right. Uh, I've been told by then that they're going to open the casino on September, September the 1st, I think. Yeah. But when I asked them, would, is there a convention facility going to be up? And they said, well, that depends on the governor. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're in this real holding pattern of we're not sure how it's going to go. On top of that, of course, we have this spot. Uh, and that's, I've got to be honest, it's really concerning me. So we'll be making a decision. I always said when we postponed back in March, because the original dates were March the 23rd to 26th, yeah, that was a bad time, right? Um, we shut down before then. That October, I was hopeful that, you know, hopefully we'll be on to this. We're the greatest country in the world, right? Yeah, we got this. Yeah, not so much. That hasn't worked so good for us, right? I, it's been a mess. So as that continues to mess, we'll have a decision to make. I originally thought that by the first week of August, I'll be able to, you know, we would make a decision. But probably in the next few weeks, we'll make that call. But until the governor says we can have it, we can't have it. But we, we're pushing on. Um, here's the shame of it, right? This was 2020. Uh, this was going to be a really big show for us. We planned. We went to three and a half days. We had a lot of speakers. Uh, we just had so many good things planned, right? And it's been pulled out from under us. Uh, but we're ready to go. You know, we, we were forced to uh, shut down like the week before. So I've got the bag and all my presenters ready to go. We don't need much time. We, it takes us a year to plan this. And here's the interesting thing about the conference business. And this is relevant not only for me, but the casino industry. Vegas cannot survive without events. They just can't. Last year, 6.5 million people came to conventions. 
you know. They're not the driving guys. They're the guys that stay here three or four days, throw over the business credit card, spend, spend, spend. And we're not getting any guidance from our state government. So, so we have this show planned. Um, but we also have this issue, and I think this is going to be the most relevant part of this, is travel. Mm-hmm. You know, right now, I, I daily look at the TSA numbers for the amount of people taking flights, air travel we're talking about. It's only sitting at about 20% normal right now. So um, it, it's difficult. If people don't want to fly, or if their companies put on a, and we're starting to hear this now, a ban on travel, it might make it difficult. So, yeah, we, you know, I don't know what to say. We, we, we have a lot of things planned. I hope it happens. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I hope for you it happens. But you know what? Garth Brooks just, just had a concert at, at, at a, a zillion drive-ins last night that, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you do need to go virtual this year. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a definite thought. Hey, Willie, I'm out of time. I appreciate you so much. And I'm going to put all sorts of information. If you look down here, you hit the show more, and you're going to see Willie's website, World Game Protection website, and you know anything else I can slam in there about Willie, and also the the Dropbox podcast the link. So, uh, Willie, before I go, any last words? Willie, can I just uh, also add, please uh, go to my Twitter site. Um, it's at Willie J Allison. Okay, why? Because every day I put on there stuff that's happening in the industry worldwide. It's related to gaming protection, game security, COVID stuff. It's a way of keeping up. Um, I mean, let's face it, there's not much else to do right now as I'm in this holding pattern. So there's a lot of information. And I know that a lot of casinos um, still haven't opened yet. They will be opening in the next few weeks. So it's just a good way to keep people up to date with game protection. And it's great stuff daily, daily. Willie. Willie, I appreciate you being with us. Thanks so much. Uh, hopefully see you this, uh, you know, this fall. That's all I can say. Thanks, Thanks. Willie.